Anne Krieger, welcome to the Ideas of India podcast. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start with uh, the famous AER paper from 1974. This is the 50th anniversary of that uh, paper. But before we discuss the nuts and bolts, uh, that paper has two case studies, one on Turkey and one on India. What made you visit Turkey and India and how did you get involved with those two countries and sort of their, you know, trade and licensing regimes and so on? Well, I mean, there are two stories. There are not one, one Turkish and one Indian. But beneath all that, of course, is the underlying story that I was always interested in the international and in development and had followed much of it right along. And so in that sense, it was natural for me to then uh, obviously be doing research that could, that involved the countries and what was going on. And I was reasonably convinced, even on the basis of what I learned uh, from basically just international trade courses and things like that, that uh, it was, it's, uh, that is not a, a, the import substitution thing was at best doubtful, or at least it needed to be, meet a pretty stern test of making it come good and all that. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of evidence of that. I don't think I knew much about exchange control or anything, but then one summer I was invited to work for the U.S. Agency for International Development, and they had me write a paper on what I was thinking about all this, and I wrote it, and I think I gave it to them late July or around there sometime. And then they say, okay, now we want you to go and try out your ideas on one country, uh, and you've got a choice of two. We could do Colombia or we could do Turkey. And I chose Turkey. I thought it would be more interesting than Colombia, and I still think I was right on that one. And so I did go there, and I was obviously worrying about the import regime. I was worried about the controls and stuff. And so I told them, I told the the the, the, the Turkish people who the embassy gave me contacts with that I just wanted to meet some Turkish businessmen and talked about what they did. So I spent some time going around Turkey and talking to them and figuring out what was happening and why. And that was the real beginning of it. Uh, and the of course, of that, of course, I learned something about that. But I had always had an interest in India long before Turkey. Yeah. And so the minute they were interested in going any further, I chose India. Okay. And so I think one, one year, maybe the third year I was doing some work in Turkey, I then left there for India directly. And that was my first visit to India. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> so this was, uh, so from, you know, uh, different biographical sketches have different years. So what I put together was you went to Turkey in 1965. I think that's and right. And in 1968 was your first visit to India. And then 69, 70, you were appointed consultant by USAID and, you know, well, so I think I was, even for the first trip to India, I thought I was, uh, you, okay. so I think, so I think the consultancy came earlier. Okay. Uh, but I, it sounds about right. I, I guess I'm a bit surprised at 68. I might have thought, I thought 69. 70. No, I guess I would have said 69. So 68 may be right. Okay. So what interested you in India? I read in one of your, uh, you know, I've, I've read so many papers at this point, <laughs> I don't know where it was exactly, uh, that uh, you were also very interested in India because of some of the graduate students uh, who introduced you to all the problems and oh, yeah. the development problems, oh, yes. the labor problems and so on. Was there anything before that? Uh, because the consensus that time was you know, that India was just doing the right thing. So what got you interested in, in sort of the, the, the nuts and bolts of the Indian system? Well, I, I guess the answer has several parts. Uh, but one, well, the first part of which is that I, I had always, I don't know why I had an interest in India. I vividly remember the, the headlines in the American newspaper the day that Gandhi was assassinated. And I was a little kid. Yeah. But that was a very important event. And I was pushing a lot of people on it until I got, and it was very bothersome. And I don't know why or what, but I mean, India had always somehow had an attraction. And I guess we'd had a day or two about India in school and things like that. But I'd always had that attraction. And so the interest was there from that reason. And of course, I, oh, I, I, in graduate school, I, as you said, I had a couple of friends, including several Indians. And some of the things I read as a result of their recommendation, for example, Nehru's Toward Freedom and things like that came out of that. And of course, many of them were very committed to the economic policies and what have you. So it was, I think, fairly natural that I'd be interested. Even before 1965, the general consensus in the 50s and 60s was that free trade was really for the developed world, the Western world in the post-war period. And developing countries were doing the right thing by being protectionist, by having, you know, infant industry protection, import substitution, import licensing. You know the list uh, better than I do. Did you ever buy into that orthodoxy or were you always skeptical of it? 
And if you did buy into it, what made you change your mind? <laughs> well, I don't know as I bought into. I don't know as I bought in. I, I see. I think I recall a graduate school saying, "Yes, there might be. A, there might be a, an industry where you had high cost of startup, but if you then set it up, you would recoup your money and you would be able to take off the protection and be able to produce for world markets and stuff." Uh, what I understood. Uh, from what I about India and about Turkey was that they were not doing any part of that, and not only were the ones that were protected not thriving, they wanted more protection, and they were not at all thinking about the international market. They knew they couldn't compete, so there was some dissonance that way. And I'm not so sure that the consensus, at least as I perceived it, was quite as strongly uh, pro import substitution and all that as you're, you're saying it is. I think there was. There was one guy whose name was Shinoy in India who was very prominent and who was obviously opposed. And I think there was a very good agricultural economist, K.N. Raj, who was very doubtful. I think some of that was there too. When you first went to India, sort of what were your impressions? Did you just immediately understand the craziness of the license permit Raj overall and also, you know, what was happening in the external and trade sector? Or did it take you a lot of time to sort of get in and figure it out? Who were you speaking with? What were your impressions? There are a number of things. Uh, I, I went there to do the same kind of work that I did, to do the same kind of study as I had done for Turkey. So already I was interested in getting into that. And I knew that I would never learn what I needed to learn by going around government offices. <laughs> I'd learned that in Turkey, almost the most important lesson. And so I basically asked them to find me a place who would help me. And I thought, I want to learn about this. And I knew about the auto industry. And so I basically said, can we find somebody who could sponsor me to take me around? And I want to compare buyer and seller information, yes. and which seemed to me to be critical because you could be told anything. Everybody always knows their own product is good and there are reasons for it. And so basically the Tatas were willing to do this. And so they basically arranged, gave me a list of their buyers or their suppliers and what have you. And, and I went around from place to place and they were very accommodating and very generous with their time and with their access to their people and all that. And I got what I needed to know. And of course, in the process, I learned a lot more. So that while I obviously knew something when I got there, I certainly didn't know as much as I learned while I was there. And of course, I've learned even more since. So I mean, it wasn't the end of the learning, but it was certainly a good basis. And so, it is true, as you just tell you, it is also true that several Indians uh, who knew the system pretty well did, did refer my book as, as this how to learn about the Indian system at one point in time. So this book is extraordinary, actually. I should uh, hold it up for the <laughs> camera. This is the benefits and costs uh, of import substitution in India. And this, I find this book extraordinary because of the level of detail. So you decide to look into the auto industry and in particular auto parts, right? Yes. So Well, that's because what they were assembling. Yes. And the, auto, the an automobile was pri high priced, but how much of that was because the cost of assembly and how much of it was the cost of the parts? And of course, the answer was it was both. Yes. And what you manage to do is amazing because you go to Hindustan Motors, you get a list of all their part supplies, I believe 50 or 60 of them. And then you write in the book that I figured out that each of these parts businesses have three sets of books, oh, yeah. one for the taxman, one for the public and one for themselves to actually understand what was going on. And that they were generous enough to open up these books to you. Was this similar to what happened in Turkey or was the Indian sort of uh, uh, problem like its own unique Indian thing? I think India is unique. Uh, <laughs> and maybe because India, of course, was under British rule. Yes. And the Brits are very much, uh, what shall I say, meticulous bookkeepers. Uh, whereas I don't think the Turks are quite as worried about the details yeah. in, in some regards. So while the system was much the same, I think the level, of, the level to which it went in India was a little bit further. And so when you looked at these three set of books, did you immediately figure out that this is a matter of rent seeking or did that insight come later after you had put all the data together? Oh, it, it came later, obviously. Um, at first, it's, it's sort of amazing. But then after you realize, okay, so these, these guys are smuggling parts or, or these guys are importing or in false pricing or whatever it is they're doing, uh, you figure out, okay, there's that. But then after a while, when there's so much of it, you realize this is not just simply a matter of you be taking money out of your pocket, that you are indeed making your living doing that when you could be doing something productive instead. And that's that was the fundamental thing is not realizing it was there. I think everybody knew. I mean, I, I remember a day or two on corruption in graduate school. But I think what we were taught was, that, well, corruption, when there's corruption, it doesn't much matter because it's simply a transfer from one person to another. Yes. 
And that would be true if it were one or two little isolated events, I suppose. But once everybody realizes that if they do this, that, or the other thing, they'll get more, then everybody competes for it. And by that time, they're spending time and resources on it. And that by that time, it is more costly. So now coming to the rent-seeking aspect of it, how much did you know about rent-seeking from the non-trade literature, you know, before you did these studies? So, for instance, there was Gordon Tulloch and his 1967 paper. Well, his paper was two things about his paper. One was what was a Western Economic yes. Journal. I didn't even know of it until about 1973 when he sent it to me and said I'd stolen his work, uh, which was not true. Uh, and, of course, his work was restricted to what monopolies do. Yeah. Which is not, a, which is also important, but it's yeah. not the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and of course, mine, I came at it from the international trade side. So, yeah. no, I did not know of that literature at the time. I'm sorry I didn't, but I didn't. No, that's, that's totally fine. What I was trying to figure out was sort of what were the influences. So, for instance, there were folks at Chicago. There was Harberger. There was, of course, you know, Stigler, who was talking about the demand side and the supply side of regulation yeah. and the kinds of problems that causes. Peltzman was just starting his work. Did any of the non trade side regulatory stuff influence? influence you at all, or this was just completely different? Well, two parts to the answer, one of which is Al Harbour was an, and is still a good friend. Uh, so in that sense, well, I'm sure we exchanged ideas. I don't remember going over this one with him in particular, uh, but certainly he knew about some of what I was thinking and all the rest of that. So in Al's case, yes, I knew George Stigler fairly well uh, and, and admired his regulate, le regulation work, but I thought of that as being different because he went, he went after the capture part of it. Yes. And that in itself was a different part of the thing, although it probably applied too, but I never thought of it actually at that time as applying to the rent seeking, if you know what I'm saying. Yes. So I guess the answer is no, it was trade. And it, it was the um, the recognition that this is not a small thing, and it is not simply a transfer. Yeah, no, absolutely, and 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 that's where you also extend Harberger's work, right? Like there. He recognizes a certain proportion as the transfer, but the deadweight losses that Harberger shows are relatively small compared to what actually you figured out uh, eventually, and then extended that. Well, that's he's looking at welfare cost only, which is a little slightly yes. different too. And that was a very important paper that yeah. covered a, a lot of territory. Yeah, he's a great man. Uh, so now coming back to India, sort of who were some of the people who influenced your work? So for for instance, you know, uh, folks like John Powers, uh, Soligo and Stern, they were working on Pakistan, uh, you know, in the early to mid 60s. They were talking about how inefficient the foreign exchange and the uh, import licensing system is in mm -hmm. Pakistan. Uh, there were, of course, Bhagwati and Desai, who I know that you got to know later, but I don't know if you knew them the first time you went to India. What? Were people talking about? Did you all know each other and connect with each other, or well, did you all land I guess on it's this? Part of the community, so to some extent, yes. But uh, no, to correct, no. In fact, I met Jagdish Bhagwati in Turkey. Oh, we were both invited to a conference on the Tur Turkish foreign trade regime, and along with a, a friend of both of ours, Michael Bruno. One night, we we're just having coffee, and he was Israeli. And we began discussing uh, what was going on in each of the three countries, me discussing Turkey and Jagdish, India, and uh, Michael, Israel, I think. I'm sure Israel. Uh, so in any event, the three of us were discussing these things, and that was the inception of the whole Bhagwati Krieger project. But, but that was later, the NBER project. No, that was so it started right there and then. That was oh, it. Wow. I mean, that, that's where we started it. So it it started as early as, say, 1966, 67? Wow. So, no, you're right, six, 67. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, it started then, but then it, I, in fact, because I had been working with USAID, yeah. uh, I undertook to try and see if I could talk them out of the funds to finance the project, which I did. But that took, I think, more than a year. Yeah. And so it was about a year or so after that that we then began to, or began to identifying authors and stuff. And I do not even remember, I could probably look it up, when the first meeting of all the authors was, but it was after that. Uh, so probably about 69 or 70. How did you choose the 10 countries and the 10 authors? Were they all part of the community or was it just each of these people had done different studies and you figured out that you're all looking at the same problem? No, we, 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 we in fact figured, as we talked to each other, we'd already figured out we were looking at the same things, which we hadn't even recognized at first. Okay. For the others, we wrote an analytical framework paper which we circulated to various people asking, would you be willing to do this on your country? And then we looked for people through the literature primarily uh, who had done work that was on the country and looked as if it was close enough to what we were looking for that they would have the 
contacts or other things they needed to, to do the work. And so it was a question of, yes, it, it would be interesting to do this country, but if you can't find anybody to do it, it doesn't work. And it, that's a person, good person, but if he's got a country that's already free trade, what are we doing? <laughs> no, that so, I appreciate. So it, it was kind of matching, and who could we find? And both of us found, both each of us knew, I would guess, two or three of them. So that's probably about six, and we each did one ourselves. So, but there were one or two that neither of us knew, but we began looking through the literature and found. So one of the biggest success stories of that time, and you know, when we when we talk to other trade economists, we learn that the South Korean story really flipped something for everyone. And uh, in your series, it was, of course, Larry Westphal who led that with a couple of his co-authors. Uh, when did you learn about South Korea? I know you visited in the early 70s, but when did you actually learn about what was happening there and how they had fixed and turned things around? Well, there was a very famous economist, fairly should have been much more famous than he was, economist. Him. It was T.C. Liu, L-I-U, I think, but I'm not sure of that. Or I don't remember. I should have looked it up. But in any event, it was at Cornell. And, of course, he'd come from mainland China and left when things had gone bad there. And he was very much... Uh, an apostle or disciple, call it what you will, of of the fact that you needed an open trade regime and trade. And he's the one who sold the Taiwanese summit. Uh-huh. And uh, in fact, I met his daughter later and, and stuff like that. And I never met him, but I don't think I met him anyway. But at any event, uh, he so he had gotten Taiwan going about 1955. And I think I read something as early as 1957 about the Taiwanese success and how Taiwan success was for booming when all everybody knew that developing countries could do nothing and here was Taiwan. So I kind of kept watching it from that from then on uh, and knew about it. Uh, but the, the Korean invitation was something that came out of the blue. I, and it had no, Larry Westfall and Charles Frank did a very good Korean study and that was important, but that was not this. Okay. Uh, and uh, so basically it came an invitation to go to visit Korea, I think 1973 or four. Yeah. Uh, and that was sort of the beginning of what still continues as a relationship in the sense of, and I learned a lot from them. Uh, although there's a lot of other learning along the way. I'll tell you one thing that was very interesting. At some point, and I would guess about 1972, I was invited among other places to Singapore to give a couple of talks. And of course, I knew Singapore was free trade and all that, but I thought it would be interesting. So I went and they'd, USAID had arranged the usual series of conferences for me to meet people ahead of time. Uh, and one of them was their planning board. And I didn't give it enough thought ahead of time. And so I asked the same questions I would have asked of the Indian Planning Commission. Uh, by what criteria do you decide? And I don't remember what the question was. It doesn't matter. But I do remember the answer. We look and see what makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, that one sentence explains the difference between Singapore and Well, I'm not sure it entirely explains it, but on the other hand, it was it was certainly an eye opener as to a different way of looking at things. And I think the Koreans are much closer to the Singaporeans than to the Indians. In the every time I came well, from the well, the first time I came there, I got off a plane. And I was in the shaggy old clothes that were one wears. So they've been on the plane overnight, so they were in horrible shape anyway. Uh, but anyway, I get off the plane, disheveled and all the rest of it, just anxious for a shower and what have you. And instead of the, they, the presses are there, what's the question for the rest? What are we doing wrong? Tell us what we're doing wrong. And I, you guys are growing at 10% per year. What is it you're doing right? Uh, but in any event, the Korean attitude is how can we do better? Yeah. Uh, it was just a very different attitude right from the beginning. And it was unbelievable. Every six months, it was a new country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and the Korean mm. growth rates like clearly seem to have unlocked something in all the other sort of policy makers who were advising, you know, developing mm. country leaders and, uh-huh. and, and so on. But in India, uh, when I, if I mentioned something about Korea, I was told it was different. And then, of course, India was too big for that. Yes. So I want to get to India, actually. So... How was your study received at the time when it came out? Because you've gone to India every few years and you've well, you stayed every in year. touch every, every year, year, right? Yeah. So you must have been meeting people. Did you just want to pull your hair out because they didn't get it? Or did some people get it, but the system couldn't be reformed? Like, what was your impression? Uh, well, I mean, there was clearly a very strong consensus in the other direction. I remember one time I was in uh, what was in Madras, Chennai. And at that time, there was some kind of a very nice... I think afternoon tea or something reception for me put on by some of the I think some of the state government people but bringing along the journalists and the others and I ended up talking to a few of the wives of the journalists and there 
explanation as to why import substitution was so good was absolutely as good as that of most of the other Indians. I mean, you know, everybody, it wasn't just the economists and it wasn't just the government officials. It was everywhere. You could, I had a guy who drew, drove one of the, a three wheeler in Delhi and I occasionally used him uh, to go places and he, he spoke enough English to explain to me uh, that, that his three wheeler was bad. He wanted a new one, but he didn't want an Indian one. And here's why. And then he explained why they couldn't get through the customs. I mean, it was, it was a common knowledge. Yeah. And But what about the policy elite, right? Because now it seems like the policy elite in India and the policy elite in the rest of the world are extremely integrated. They almost always sound the same and say very similar things. I imagine that time it wasn't the case, was, especially your experience. Well, it wasn't the experience of anybody working on trade issues in developing countries. It just yeah. wasn't. Yeah. Um, if I can do this without naming any names, at some point I was coming back to India and one of the secretaries in one of the important economic ministries uh, said, you know, you've been selling this for years, but you've never heard the counter arguments. Come give a talk on a Saturday morning at our ministry. I'll invite in the other chief secretaries and so on and we'll have a discussion. So I went in front of the discussion on the Saturday morning and made my pitch. Uh, which by that time was a little bit smoother than it was earlier on. But, I, you know, say, and I knew India well enough so I could apply it to India, no problem there. And I was reasonably content with it as it, uh, as it finished up. And so the first question came from my host. And the first question was, now, well, now, madam, surely you know that India is a poor country. And surely you know that there are two kinds of goods. There are luxuries and there are necessities. Now, surely it would be criminal for a poor country to produce luxuries, and how could we possibly export necessities? <laughs> and the discussion did not <laughs> change very much from that level. So what made you go back over and over again and still have some kind of optimism that <laughs> something would change or uh... well pa partly that just simply that I like India so yeah. that made that it made it easier and I I still love going to a dance or you know a concert or something like that and I can do all that there and I have friends there which is another part of it so I could go back that way but on top of that I mean the rest of the world was doing differently and I was convinced that at some point uh it would just have to be changing because everybody would finally perceive that they'd just been left behind in That's true. several centuries ago. So I, I don't think it was really conviction that it would change so much as you got to keep trying. And, you know, when we did the 1991 Oral History Project, we spoke with all mm. the folks who were part of the reforms mm. and the change that was brought in in 1991. Mm. And uh, so, you know, Montek Singh Aluvalia, Shankaracharya, uh, you know, Ashok Desai, Rakesh Mohan, uh, uh, so many, Vijay Kelkar, like we've spoken to so many of the folks who were there yeah. at that time. And... Uh, they all talk about some of the big influences. So one of them is, of course, you know, planning for industrialization by uh, Jagdish Bhagwati and Padma Desai. Uh, there was also the uh, Ian Little, Skitovsky and Morris Scott book. This is Industry and Trade in Some Developing Countries. They also changed their mind, yeah. uh, you know, during the 60s. And then the next is yours, right? Your work. So mm -hmm. they always mention your study on India and uh, also the NBER series which with uh, sure. Jagdish, which was hugely influential. Uh, did you have a sense of how things were slowly changing or did you just figure all that out much, much later? I don't think I had a sense of how much things were changing. Uh, there are some people uh, still around who, who do believe that the changes started in the 1980s, which yes. I do not buy. Uh, it just wasn't, I don't think the data really, so, so, uh, but certainly the rhetoric at that time did not. Uh, and at that time, there was there were a couple of years there where I was reasonably discouraged because I thought uh, the rest of the world was moving on and India was not. Yeah. Uh, what did the Chinese experience give you a lot of hope and that, look, that's a huge country? Because I think that's another thing that changed for India. You know, when it was Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the Indian elite were like, oh, those are small countries. They can manage this. India is a large and poor country. But when China liberalizes, suddenly Indian policy make makers are talking about what do we need to do to catch up? So was that a big moment for, uh, for the trade folks and for you in particular? <laughs> Before that moment, the Japanese foreign aid minister 
came to India and was taken on yes. a tour and read, of course, very nicely because, of course, India, uh, appre- the government officials appreciated what he might do and so on. And they gave a very nice banquet for him the last night he was there. And they asked him to stand up and give his impressions. And he started, I'm paraphrasing like mad, because at first I've never heard the talk. I heard of the talk. Uh, but I've heard it both from the Japanese side and the Indian. But So I'm pretty sure it's true. Uh, but at any event, and so he went on, he said, he knew in, before he came, he knew India was a wonderful country and he was all excited to see it and so on and so forth. And he said, uh, and he didn't understand why. And he said that everybody told him, well, India was too big to export, that that was the problem. So he had done some homework. And what he had done is he had went and looked for the numbers of Singapore. And Singapore had a population of, I think, around 4 million people or something at that time. So then he looked around Indian cities and he decided Chennai was about the same size as Singapore. Then he looked at what Singapore exported which was more than what India exported. So what he thought should happen is Chennai should do all the exporting. (laughs) That's such a fantastic way to make the point. What what I'm saying is that it it was not just the ones you cited who are the English language uh, speakers. Uh, There were others who were after him too, and the Japanese were likewise uh, saying things were amiss to some extent at least, and, and he was one of them. That's the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer is, I don't, in my recall, I do not think that the Chinese very rapid growth was perceived as that much of a success until around 2000. I think the Indian changes came before that. I think there were several reasons why we didn't perceive China first. Uh, One of which was, of course, it was so poor too. Another which it was so close, we didn't understand it as well. Uh, But a third of which is, of course, that with Mao, things had gotten so bad that when he came out from under that, you would expect it to bounce back even if they hadn't changed the system. And it wasn't until the middle 1990s even that it began looking as if there's something more. And I must confess, I was still a skeptic as to whether the Chinese could do it, continue and sustain it even as late as 1997, 98, that I just did not think that without removing some of their constraints and what have you, that they could continue as long as they have. So now looking back at your 1974 paper, one of the things that you talk about when you talk about the Indian case study is that this kind of import substitution, import licensing system, you know, has huge rents. Actually, today morning, my I was talking to my parents who are still in India and they asked me who's Anne Krieger. And I said, well, she's the person that India owes at least 7.3% of its 1968 GNP, uh, because that's what you estimate in this paper as uh, <laughs> sort of the loss from uh, from the craziness that's going on. Um, um, so one of your recommendations is that it's better to switch to a tariff regime yeah. uh, as if you still wish to be protectionist, at least it won't have these kinds of problems uh, and so on. Now, India did switch to a tariff regime for the auto industry, as you well know, and the tariffs are over 100% uh, in many cases. Uh, so how do you look back at the auto industry now? Do you look at things as, oh, my God, it used to be so much worse or they could have done so much better? <laughs> Well, I, both of those are true, of course. It, it, it was worse then, and it is better. So that's part of it. And yes, they could have done so much better. There's also no doubt about that. So uh, both of those parts are true. I think for a while after 1991, the tariffs were taken off. And I think the um, Maruti and so on right in there were done without that. And that's what made the big change. And after that, people wouldn't quite accept the poor quality they would before, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think it's sad that those tariffs had come back because I think that without those tariffs, some of the auto parts and manufacturers would have developed into successful exporters. Yes. And that's the part that no, you can't see what isn't there. And that's exactly. what makes it so hard in economics to say, yes, you got this, but you could have had that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And also, when I go back to India, I see Indians spending twice the amount, you know, not even like purchasing par parity terms or something, literally twice the dollar amount on cars, car models that are like 25 years old, that are still being sold in India by foreign brands and manufacturers when they could have like, just far better cars, safer cars, uh, more fuel efficient cars, uh, uh, and so on. Yeah, Uh, by the way, 100% 100% tariff on, on auto or auto parts was not all that unusual in the developing countries at that time. I think at one point, for, unless my memory is mistaken, Chile, before they moved away from all this system, had a tariff over a 1,000%. Oh, wow. I yeah. think some of those tariffs. And, of course, tariff equivalents, even in India, were very much higher uh, than yes. was recognized because people didn't figure out that, indeed, they're getting their materials at a lower cost, and now they're getting their big value added. Yeah, blown up. And and here, I mean, you talk about this uh, in this particular book mm-hmm. in the in the developing countries lectures. There are a lo- number of lovely tables, and there, you know, eventually I figure out that 
Turkey eventually reduced tariffs to almost like 10, like single digits, I think, somewhere between 3% and 10% is mm. where the auto tariffs are. So uh, from that study, some people seem to have taken the right lesson. <laughs> and some people are yet to figure out, uh, or at least mm. maybe they just didn't read the last page and, of your study. Turkey is now a major exporter of auto parts. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. Uh, so I want to go to the um, sort of the the next phase of your life, so to speak. So all this work was done. I mean, you started your career at University of Minnesota. That was your first job. Initially, you wrote some very theoretical model kind of papers. Then you switched to all this empirical work, detailed case studies. You did the NBR series, of course, which has uh, just sort of changed the game. Now, when everyone looks back, uh, you know, that's the series that is that is quoted. And after that, you move on to the World Bank. So the first question I have is, what made you do that? And then I have a number of questions about the bank. Well, they asked me to go. Is the simple answer to why? Did you have a sense of what were their views on trade and development before you went there? Or was it all like you were discovering as you went along? I, I don't think I was ignorant completely. But on the other hand, I did not appreciate the extent to which they had bought into uh, some of the governments should manage and control. Yeah. And so it was, the answer is, I knew some of it, but I learned more once I got there. Yeah. And the only major difference that I find is that, you know, developing countries would call it like industrial planning. And uh, the World Bank uh, rhetoric was a little bit different. It was like managerial economics, where the government is kind of pulling the levers. But it's basically, you know, it's the, it's the same wine in a, in well, a different no, there bottle. There was very, mu very much of that. And when I got there, uh, there were a number of things that simply as far as I was concerned, if, if I was going to be supposed to be chief economist of the place, they were not going to be. Yeah. So... This is so a couple of questions. Uh, when we spoke with Rakesh Mohan, who was also at the bank, uh, you know, in the 80s, he said that when you joined succeeding Hollis Chenery, he said Anne turned the whole thing around, right? And it was not always now, I mean, end quote, but you know, that it was not always popular. There was a the, there were a lot of people That's were shocked. Right. You literally did like a sort of 180 degree flip uh, from what the research departments and the policy departments mm -hmm. were saying at that time. So like a two-part question. One is, how easy or difficult was it to do that, uh, even though you were right at the top? And second, uh, why was that required? Why hadn't all the work that you had done in the 60s and 70s and everyone else had done, why hadn't that reached Washington, D.C. yet? Well, I can't answer the second part, obviously. I just don't know. Hallis had been there for a long time. Uh, his training was more as an, as an engineer, and he did point out waste. I mean, it wasn't that he missed it all and so on, uh, but he certainly did not did not have my view as the role of incentives and all that in the private sector, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he contributed importantly, of course, with his empirical work. So I had a lot of respect for him and all that, and in that sense, it's fine. Uh, okay, so then was it hard? Oh, I don't know what you heard me. I mean, it was, there was no choice. I mean, I was not going to be in charge of something, or I was not going to sign off on something that said some of these things. And so I, it was either I've come here and I'm going to quit quickly or I'm going to try and fight it through. And so we fight until we can't decide we can't do it and then we leave. No, what I mean by hard is not that you had to just make tough decisions or tough choices. I mean, it's clear the, the path that you chose. Hard more in terms of one of the big things that you have to do in terms of research is bring out the World Bank research report Every country desk is working on things. They have to use those insights both towards form writing the report, but also communicate it back to the governments mm -hmm. that they're working with. Was that process easy because there were a lot of young folks who understood what you were trying to tell them? Or was it just you were fighting the intellectual orthodoxy every day, every meeting, well, every report? Something of both. Uh, first off, the research department itself uh, had some, had half of it was doing things that you needed doing world debt and country debt uh, and trade statistics and so on, on to many other issues. And that, that half was, I don't know whether it, it, it could, it was pretty good. Uh, it could be better and some improvements were made. That's always true. Uh, but it was sort of flexible. It was the other half was with the researchers. And most of them were younger people who had gotten their PhD and gone straight to the World Bank. Yeah. And so basically they had had almost no experience of developing countries. The first time they went to a developing country, they were given a World Bank briefcase, of course. And then they got off the plane and they were treated like, you know, uh, important people. And so they thought they were important. And I think that just continued. And at that time, in many countries, the... the the qualifications and the background of the people who were there were sufficiently 
uh, unfortunate uh, for lack of education and so on that uh, sometimes even then they could have provided reasonably decent advice. And sometimes it was so obvious what needed to doing that even if you thought you needed to manage everything, you could say that this is, needs to be done, even if the implication was that it should be done, that I thought it should be done another way. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a mixture. The, the things that mattered were things like the World Development Report. Yeah. That was very important. And some of those worldwide publications. And those were where getting it out done right was a critical issue. So now with the bank, one of the things that you really start hammering on, which is a little bit different from the other trade economists and the trade policy folks, is the importance of macroeconomic stability. So what were some of the experiences that led to that? Uh, was it sort of the crises that you saw when you were at the World Bank just before that, you know, the currency crisis in Turkey. So what sort of brought that uh, sort of insight about? Well, first off, uh, you, I mean, the, the, fir the first off is, remember, Turkey had inflation, what have you, and badly misbalanced in the late 1960s and stuff. Yes. And so I already knew about that, which was important. Uh, but secondly, and probably equally important, I certainly understood that when you have exchange control and you're not getting any exports, then the price of, Im the price of import competing go goods goes way up. Up, and until you can get the exchange rate right, you can't do much about the other things. And the trouble with that is you can't get the exchange rate right until you've got the underlying macro right. Yeah. But I mean, I, I was an economist, and I'd always learned that you needed a reasonably balanced budget. So for me, it was no, what should I say? It, it was no great insight or anything. That I, it just simply was part of what had to be. And we did the, the series, which you haven't mentioned, the agricultural yes. studies. And in there, uh, I think this astonishment, even the agricultural economists were surprised when you could show that the exchange rate was at least as important yeah. as some of these other things. that they, they just hadn't thought about this as part of it. They thought that was part of the macro. So part of the answer is that. that is simply, uh, it wasn't to me, it wasn't macro. It was simply how do you do policy to get the incentives right so that people do the kinds of things that are best for the country. So my... You know, when I look at that literature, especially if I if I try and read it in chronological order, the sense I get is the trade economists are really just talking about trade. Sometimes they're also talking about foreign exchange and foreign exchange constraints, but they're not going into monetary policy. They're not going into, you know, should there be a, a consensus towards Bretton Woods or should they all start moving away from that? So you are and your tenure at the World Bank is sort of the first point I see where that starts changing, that, that you know, there's this idea that these things need to go hand in hand. In fact, even at your time in the bank, you're looking at agriculture, you're looking at manufacturing reforms and trade, you're looking at FDI, which mm -hmm. is very early, you know, uh, yeah. relative to all the others, FDI and privatization, uh, population, like these are some of the big themes during your four and a half yeah. years at the bank. So that to me is quite unique. I don't see other trade economists doing that then or even now. Well, one one of the interesting things to me after I got to the fund later on uh, was that I went to have friend, lunch or a meal or coffee or whatever with friends from the World Bank. And if I if we got discussing some country that had macro problems, I was astonished at the lack of depth of the knowledge of some of the bank economists because they just aren't exposed to it to the same extent. Uh, and I guess part of the answer, I was actually teaching graduate macro at Minnesota for a while, so I guess I had to know some of them that too. <laughs> and no. on and on. But I mean, I, I, the other thing though that's interesting is what's interesting about your comment, which I hadn't thought about, is when I was a graduate student and when I was first teaching, there was not such a course as trade, and such another course of balance. I mean, there was one, you took one field, it was international economics. And the two were meshed. They were not separate fields. Okay. So you did do exchange rate stuff. And I, there's a little book I did on exchange rate determination, yeah. uh, which was part of an outcome and part of that. So the, those two fields being together, it was natural uh, to sort of see them together. That's interesting because what I see most, I mean, I would put you more in the micro foundations, micro economist mm -hmm. sort of uh, side of things. And usually I see those uh, economists just focus quite narrowly on one thing. Sometimes they work into the adjacencies, mm -hmm. right, of what's going on. So someone like, say, Arun Shori, who wrote his yeah, uh, right. dissertation on foreign exchange, he's able to do that, right? He's able to kind of trace the entire license yeah. permit system. Uh, Padma Desai and Jagdish Bhagwati, 
of course, managed to do that in their work. Uh, but I don't see people go much beyond that because, and even in India, actually, the the external sector playbook, you know, for trade, for foreign exchange reserves, for how we devalue, mm-hmm. how we stabilize the currency, that was written, you know, by uh, C. Rangarajan, and that sort of report work that was done, that was very much considered the realm of monetary policy. Monetary economists do that kind of work, so that's one of the reasons that I find uh, what you did uh, quite quite unique mm. and interesting. Yeah, the problem, I suppose, you could say another way, is that indeed uh, the macro was not that important for what's happening on the trade side because yeah. what was, because given the exchange rate and exchange control, you had the the the, the you were just leaving the exchange rate fixed when it shouldn't be, and with exchange control, you were bottling up the macro problem, so it wasn't part of trade problem. Yeah. If yeah. you see what I mean. Yeah, I do see what you yeah, mean. Yeah. So one of the the things that changes in the 1980s is also what they now call the Washington Consensus, right? That this, you can't just have trade liberalization. Uh, there's a bunch of things you need to do together. Otherwise, you sort of just bump yourself from one crisis to another uh, and, and you know, go along. Uh, so I have a cheeky question about that. Why is it called the Washington Consensus and not the Krieger Consensus? <laughs> Well, I think for the first part of the answer is, of course, that when uh, b- b- when I'm, we were starting to look at these things, some people more readily than others began thinking that we that you know some of these things they're doing. And by the time John Williamson wanted to talk about the Washington Consensus, the whole list was there, which it wasn't for most people most of the time. Maybe uh-huh. it wasn't consensus before that. I don't know. Yeah, so uh, he chose the title, not me. I would call it the Greek consensus. <laughs> you managed to somehow bring, you know, that that consensus back. Uh, so now, when you look back at the World Bank, uh, how do you think of your time there and the sort of enormous impact that it had, especially, you know, in changing the consensus from the policy point of view, you know, towards government? So I think of your work in the late sixties and seventies as changing the consensus amongst economists, hmm. and maybe some policy economists, but mostly amongst trade economists and so on. And then your work in the 80s as really changing the consensus among the <laughs> government elite. I think first of all, you're giving me too much credit. I do think that there were a lot of people working on a lot of parts of it. And I also think, as you said, that the Taiwanese and Korean experience was very important in all this. And seeing, and remember, Korea had had high inflation. They had to bring yes. down too. And that was necessary to get the exchange rate in line. So the Koreans had a lot to say, I think, on all of this and making that important. Uh, the, the, the truthful answer is that after, I never believe that after you leave a post that you need to go back and second guess your successor. That that's not a very, and I truthfully have not followed the World Bank that closely. So it's like I'm beginning to follow it a bit more now. First off, I've been gone long enough. And secondly, the issues are different. Yeah. Uh, but certainly in terms of the kind of thing you're asking, I can't tell you very much. What was unique about the 80s? Because one thing I can point to is sort of, you know, it's also the time of Reagan and Thatcher. Mm-hmm. And there's a different kind of global political consensus that's going on that's moving more towards, you know, free trade, more more free democracy and free trade in general. But these two seem to be very charismatic leaders, uh, you know, to sort of spread the message. You're there at the bank. Uh, the bank and IMF start having enormous influence. So what was it in the 80s that somehow changed things? Is there something weird about that time? Well, I don't know. One part of the answer is that the in some countries, including the UK, uh, quite clearly the policies that have been followed were leading the country into yeah. the ground. Yeah. And so in Mrs. Thatcher's case, she had uh, the Scargill strike, strike and all those things going, and that led so many people to think that there's something was going wrong, that she had a, a pretty wide open space in which she could then get some of these reforms made, which quite clearly did make a difference, although things happen. And I guess I tend to think that uh, obviously when there are mistakes, what happens is that people more and things that are going well, people more and more take for granted. And the things that aren't going so well, they more and more harp upon. Yeah. Uh, the result of which is finally they've forgotten what they take for granted. They begin wondering <laughs> about the others. And so the question is, do we have, we have to rediscover the wheel in order to get the other things right? No, I, 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 can, I can see why that might be uh, the, the way you look at that. Uh, when it comes to Africa, it seems that a lot of the work that you and all our colleagues were doing, to me, it seems like it had a lot more impact on Asia and a lot less impact on Africa. Whereas if you look at maybe, say, two, three decades before that, Asia and Africa are at about the same level of... Ghana's per capita income, according to one of the figures I... I think I published somewhere or other was it from UN documents was 22 times the per capita income of Korea in 1960. Wow. Yeah. So Korea is obviously the miracle, right? So it was I mean for the well, listeners Taiwan would be the yeah, same. Yeah, Taiwan. 
Yeah. No, but Korea was did where... You know, did you know that Korea's, South Korea's per capita income is now above Japan's? Yes. Yes. It's extraordinary. Yeah. The Korean miracle to me is the is the greatest achievement of the last, say, half <laughs> century or something like that. But to me, what's even more extraordinary is unlike Ghana or even, you know, to a certain extent, Taiwan, Korea was sort of ravaged by civil war. Uh, when Korea, when we look at Korean numbers in, say, the mid-50s, it's where Yemen... And Syria are today. Yeah. It's it's really like one of like maybe the second or the third worst economies in the world. Uh, so that seems even more remarkable because you know Ghana already it seemed like it was already a little bit ahead. It was the great hope of country. Africa at the time yeah. it gained independence. Yeah. So why did Africa not go the same way as Asia? Why did all of you have so much influence on Asia? Africa also has a number of post-colonial countries, lots of places like India with the same bad, you know, import licensing system, same good bookkeeping, English. They go back and forth. They listen to the elite consensus in the World Bank and in London. But somehow just things didn't quite work there. I don't have an answer, of course. Um, I think if we went back... The educational attainment of the population was lower in Africa, in most countries by quite a bit. I'm not certain of that, but I think so. Uh, but uh, even as I say that, I have to remember that the all instruction in Korea under the Japanese colonial empire was, was in Japanese. There was no instruction in Korean. Wow. So uh, I just don't know. But uh, th and certainly the Asians take pride in their appreciation of ed of educational attainment in a way that I don't know has happened to the same extent. In Africa, Africa had raw materials, which doesn't help a thing because they could live off those rents. And so the politics in Africa, to my view, became more about who, it's my turn to get the royalties from the copper or whatever it is yes. now. You had your turn, give it to me. I, yes. With the election, I'll take it for a while, then, then they'll get mad at me and I'll give it back to you. Yeah, and I think there's less of that in Asia. I think Park Chuk uh the Korean president from 1960 to 1980, yeah. uh, 1970, uh, was obviously dedicated to going down in history as a man who turned his country around. Yeah. And he was austere. I mean, he, yeah. he, he, That's one big uh, sort of, you know, South Korean trait, right? The, just the fiscal austerity and also mm. the willingness to let go of losers and just focus on the economic performance of winners and then well, double but, and double and double. That's, of course, the thing that if you if you let the losers go, you, you'll do better. And, of course, that's what, one of the things the Koreans did by opening up and saying you must perform. Yeah. Which India never had because you had the protection so that everybody could, if you got your import license, you could do it. Yeah. So now... Looking at India, so 1991 reforms now already, you know, 33 years ago. Uh, in the 90s, there was quite a bit of momentum, you know, tariffs were consistently slashed. There were a number of sort of, uh, you know, disinvestments, privatization programs, FDI was brought in. And then that momentum seems to have been lost, say, in the last decade or so. And also, we've done a bit of a U-turn on certain kinds of, you know, tariffs have increased in certain areas. Uh, the pandemic certainly hasn't helped. So when you look at the reform story of India, how do you think about it? Is it that that was a wonderful thing that happened. Is it that there's so much more that left to that's left to be done? Both, <laughs> uh, both. This is an excellent volume, uh, you know, where you talk about the kinds of economic policy reforms mm -hmm. that are required. It's got uh, amazing, like you know, T. N. Trinavasan, Bhagwati, even the commentators, Montek Singh, uh, yeah. your student Sajid Chinoy, and you have mm -hmm. the the opening essay. Uh, it's really a remarkable book, but it's already dated. But even in this book, I can feel that sense of urgency that. There's so much more to be done, and this is the next reform agenda. So how do you feel about that looking back? Well, I mean, quite clearly the 90s were important, and they got some of the macro issues, especially the exchange rate, more under control, although I'm not so sure it's still there. I think there's a big monetary problem at the moment, I'm afraid. But be that as it may, there was that success. Then the other thing that happened that nobody in India comments on, and I haven't had a chance to take a close look myself, is that the WTO, World Trade Organization, in 2001 or two, I'm not yes, sure 2001. which. 2001 decided that the Indian banning of consumer goods imports yes. was WTO illegal. The result of which was India removed that. And I, I still think that that had a great deal to do Absolutely. with India doing as well as it did for the next seven or eight years. Yeah. And then you got also some changes in monetary policy through the central bank. And those reforms were increasingly very important in, in the just 2010, 2010, 2010. 
15 or something period like that. And so you had a series of things, each of which was going in the right direction. But the trouble is that there are still those guys in the office that still with their stamps ready to go. And it still takes 10 years to get your uh, your husband's estate pro, uh, through probate and stuff like that. Yes. And, and some, 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 some many of the barnacles of the old system are still there. Yeah. And you also, you know, this is right from your very early work on trade and, you know, sort of in that first volume, uh, you first two volumes, I mean, you talk about how it's not just about import substitution versus tariffs, you need to bring around transportation costs, you need to reform in, sure. in a way like land and labor such that infrastructure can be pulled together. You talk about the cost of urbanizing, like, like it's a whole slate of reforms, right? Well, of course, I mean, they all go together, too. And, then, and so when you leave one or two behind, uh, then you're, then you're sort of tying everything else somewhat back but you're also when you remove one of the constraints you let some things go forward and yes. so you get better growth than you got but not what you could if you did the whole thing yeah i always think of the sort of you know i mean there's a thicket of regulation in india which is mostly bad and i always think of it as you get you clear one so it you, that used to be the binding constraint yeah. the import substitution used to be the binding constraint now it's no longer the binding constraint now the binding constraint is yes. transportation costs or labor yeah. or land or something else so always you very quickly hit the ceiling mm -hmm, <laughs> and mm -hmm. then, you know, uh, they can't go beyond that. What do you make of just the the asymmetry of the overall scale of India versus the scale of enterprises, right? So this is one of the great mysteries to me uh, about why India can't figure out that it, its enterprises need to scale. So wherever you go, everything tends to remain tiny. Even successful firms don't grow much beyond a point. They don't turn into franchises and so on uh, until very recently. So when you were in India, like every visit, what did you sort of make of that? Uh, uh, well, I actually did a paper. Well, I visited with Ikri, I think 2005 or something, uh, on the subject of what was going on there. And and, and in fact, I've, I think I've gone public uh, also saying that, I mean, what's basically gone wrong, among other things, is that labor is bottled up in agriculture. Absolutely. And when it's bottled up in agriculture, obviously you can't get productivity rising much there because you can't get the labor-saving devices and stuff that advanced countries earlier got. And on top of that, in industry, nobody wants to take the people because obviously the labor laws are such that uh, you can corral the guy in his uh, office or whatever else you want to do to him. And the, the industrialists are terrified for good reason. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that there are big problems in that. And the, the answer comes, uh, well, of course, we've already liberalized in one or two states, which probably yes. does make something of a difference. But how much, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, but I think there are a lot of things in the labor market itself that are big source of the problem. And, of course, the real trouble is if you want to give so many people a very nice cushy jobs, the kind they have in the West, uh, and you don't have the resources for it, you give it to a few people, the other people are going to be, the rest of the people are going to be even worse off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, and that's exactly, exactly what we see in India. Yeah. Uh, I have some questions which are not precisely about India, just more uh, re related to this book, actually. I recommend everyone mm -hmm. reads your book on international trade, the recent one. It's very, very readable. The students of any level will be able to fully comprehend what's going on. It's supposed to be more public or more accessible to the public. Yeah, and it and it sort of incorporates so much of the research that you've, you've done over the years. I want to start with the WTO. So the GATT was just clearly a very, very, very successful sort of treaty formation. Uh, it worked well. It was enforced well. There was a lot of agreement. The WTO was supposed to do that and much more be binding, not just on the executive, also on the legislature mm -hmm. and for a lot more countries. What went wrong with the WTO? Did they try well, to... nothing at first. The yeah. dispute settlement mechanism under the WTO was better. Yeah. Uh, and was one of the big achievements of the transformation of the GATT into, into the WTO. Uh, and lots of other things went well. China, of course, came into the WTO. Yeah. Uh, and all of those things went well. Uh, what went wrong... Well, I mean, two... Okay. Uh, back off a track. When politicians can't agree on something and they got to pass a law, yeah. what happens is they choose ambiguous wording. Yeah. And so when there is ambiguous wording in the WTO agreement, it's because they couldn't agree. What's the definition of a subsidy or what have you? Yeah. So you leave the wording, so you leave it on the dispute settlement mechanism. Then you get somebody who says, well, that's not fair because that's a political decision. 
which the politicians decided not to make. <laughs> and then the politicians also killed the dispute resolution mechanism. Well, At least that that's is what more happened. recent. That's what happened yeah. as, as a final result. Of the United States, I regret to say, did that, much, I think, to its own loss. Yeah. Uh, so I do not think it was a smart thing to do. Uh, but but it happened because they said, oh, we're losing all this because we're losing these cases. As far I have not looked at them all. But as far as I know, the cases that went to the WTO were cases that the decision was one. I, I've not seen anybody that really said this was a bad decision they shouldn't have made. One sense that I get when I look at the WTO is, was it trying to do too much too soon? Too much agreement across too many issues for too many countries? Is that the problem? I'm not sure that's the problem. It may It's certainly part of it. But one way, another way of perhaps saying the same thing is everything is supposed to be done by unanimity. Yes. And that means that even two, three countries would be one too many, in a sense, uh, and for some bargaining activities. And for the WTO, of course, the unanimity thing, I think, has been, I think the IMF, with all its differences and so on and so forth, and of all the problems with it, the system of having an executive uh, executive director board of 24, where then countries, smaller countries have to share an executive director and reach agreement among themselves, where probably is a better model than the WTO model, just in simply in terms of getting things done, because the IMF has 24 sitting around the table. Yeah. Having 167 around the table is not a good idea. Yeah. And so I think there's something to that, but that's not the only problem. The problem is the world has moved on. Yeah. And with the world moving on, there are new problems, and some of them are just intractably difficult. Yeah. And so far, uh, some of them, we just have not been able to reach a way to get me. Probably the most serious one is defining a subsidy. Yeah. Which you'd think was very easy. Another question I have is there's a very clear sense that the United States has lost uh, its position as the leadership role in global free trade, right? Uh, but I have a more domestic question based around that. There was, to me, it seems about 100, 150 year long bipartisan consensus within the United States that free trade is the correct policy. And when did that consensus break down and why did it break down? It seems to be around the time of the Cold War. So I don't know if that had something to do with it, but what's your sense of it? Well, the first part of the answer is that nobody's got a really, not, nobody's got a theory that everybody else really accepts because it's too, more of a puzzle than that. Um, I, you said something about uh, the United States had done something with regard to, uh, and, and, and get, lost its leadership position. It didn't lose it, it gave it up. Yeah, and there is a difference. Yeah, uh, and the I think many people did in the rest of the world did not appreciate exactly how the U.S. had been doing reasonably well despite yeah. its flaws uh, in the whole in in leadership in the world and how hard it is, particularly in the WTO with 167 members yes. without the U.S. to get anything done. And so that's the first thing. The second thing, of course, uh, is the rise of China. Yeah, and for reasons I do not understand. Um, or I certainly don't understand them all. Uh, why is it that all of a sudden the United States is so threatened? Uh, and why is it that the United States is doing these things? I, and I don't really have a good answer. Um, a little bit of me wants to say that we had an accident of politics uh, that has had huge consequences, but somehow or other, I'm pretty convinced it has to be more than that. Uh, United States is a big country. Uh, so that's certainly part of it. And being a big country, it looks inward more than it sh should and outward less than it should. And certainly that's true. Um, but on the other hand, if you then look from where all of the objections, things are, there's coming some, much of, much of the extreme right is coming from places where trade is not that important. And that makes it all the re more remarkable. Uh, you could say, well, unions have lost, uh, out which they have. Uh, but on the other hand, union membership is now down to something like 9% of the labor force. So how come the unions are so important? Yeah. And on and on. Uh, it's very hard to say one thing. I think the fact that so much many more goods are more complicated and do take more scientific input means that the role of intellectual property and the role of protection of scientific secrets, both commercially and militarily, has become much more important. Yeah. And nobody has yet found an answer that even a few people will accept as to how you solve those problems. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I can think of ways that maybe you could get the military one done if you could ring fence the stuff you needed. And I think there's a way of doing that. But how you do that until you do something on the subsidy issue and get a definition there, I don't know. And so many people seem to be willing to believe that since somebody says that the Chinese have cheated, they've cheated. 
Uh, on the other hand, they forget that perhaps the same things go on in other countries. Uh, I was once a director of a company, and we we went to the electronic show, as one should, and to show our new equipment and stuff. We assigned, we had made sure we had at least one, no, almost always two employees around the clock watching it so that people couldn't come and steal our secrets. And I think every other company in this country does the same thing. Yeah. And I think if anybody can steal anybody else's, they will. Uh, and and the same I think goes and I you know the same thing I'm sure I guess I would worry if I thought that there was nobody from the CIA going and seeing what they could get from China, uh, and that's part of the way the world is. But somehow or other, there's an American paranoia about it, as if we never did it, which of course that certainly cannot be completely true. And uh, somehow or other, this threat. We the funny thing about it in a way is that the rhetoric about China now is not that different from what it was about Japan in the 1990s. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, again, I think, paranoia. Yeah, and I mean, and this seems to be bipartisan paranoia, right? So I was under the expectation that Biden will undo some of the protectionist damage that you, Trump you did. Alone, you weren't alone in that. Yeah, and, and it's the opposite. So this week, he he just announced uh, that the, the most recent tariffs on China, 25% on steel and aluminum, 50% on semiconductors, 100% on EVs, uh, you know, 50% on solar panels, like Biden and the Democratic Party, that politics cares about climate change, cares about you know, moving towards cleaner sources of fuel. So to me, the whole thing just seems baffling. Are you baffled by this or do well, you see this what, as a what, continuation? What certainly, one thing that certainly has made things worse is that in 1968, you may know from history that there were riots around, yes. especially the Democratic Convention. Yes. And one of the consequences of that, and I never understood quite why that followed, but it did, was that the Democrats decided that they should have primaries instead of having smoke-filled rooms decide who candidates should yes. be. Yes. And the trouble with that was that it gave to each party uh, more strength to the extremes and less to the middle. And whereas the art before for the politicians had been to choose the guy most likely to beat the opponent in the general election, now enough the, the left wing and the right wing seem to have sufficient power to drive some of the centrists out of office. Out of even Some of them have not even run for the retain, in the primaries to retain their seat. They quit because they know they can't be, win a primary because the extremists are there and they're so well-funded. Trying to connect this to some of your rent-seeking work, is there maybe too little money in politics now? Like not enough U.S. businessmen lobbying properly <laughs> as their job should be to get all this crap removed from the table? What's going on? Well, if, if anybody heard you say that the problem was too little money in politics, <laughs> they would send you to have your head examined, I think. <laughs> but uh, no, I don't know what the... Well, the problem is, is in part that, yes, again, I think part of it is simply we, we live in a very complicated world. And with a very complicated world, the the, the side swiping of things from measures, from regulations and what have you, can be much greater than is, and sometimes totally unintended. And the result of that is, that whereas it used to be that probably there were a few, I'm guessing, if you, I don't know the numbers, a few lobbyists around. Uh, now there are hundreds because they're watching out for when there's that last paragraph that will say such and such. And I was reading one yesterday, I forgot what it was, where there was some some overlooked side effect or something that had been ignored. The legislation was going through, and now they had to lobby to reverse it. And it was very technical, which is probably why I forgot it. Uh, but nonetheless, it was happening all the time on everything because things are not that simple. There's no such thing as oil. Yeah. On the what is there, 29 different grades, and you cannot take a refinery that's used to producing the one at the high end to do one at the low end. Yeah. Uh, so that, and you can't even have the same pipelines. Yeah. Uh, well, once you get to that degree of technical specificity, it's, it's 57 different types of steel. Yeah. Uh, according to yeah, the Yeah, I read it. I think yeah. it's a similar number. It's well, there may, in this it may book. be more than that by now, for all we know. Uh, but be that as it may, once you have that level of technical. Who's going to follow up and who's going to uh, be outraged when they read the paper tomorrow morning that the uh, ITC decided that it was okay for three-inch pipes to have such a, a quarter more latitude than whatever? Yeah. And there's, I think, a lot of just that technical so, stuff. Then you get the environmentalists, yeah. and they're pushing on the other side. So you're getting more lobbyists, partly because they're defending their industry from – too much loss because of the environmental issues. And then you got the Biden administration. Goodness knows why. The solar panel is almost the most ridiculous from yeah. what I can tell. 
it it just even the i mean electric vehicles it doesn't quite make sense to me i mean on the one hand the united states is keen on a lot of people adopting electric vehicles it's actually explicitly giving a subsidy both on solar panels and electric vehicles uh, you know they're trying to get the infrastructure of the charging stations to be you know to to quickly improve which will only happen if enough people adopt electric vehicles so this just feels like a complete own goal and honestly i didn't expect it from biden well, the solar panels was coming. I think it's a surprise how high it was. I think he'd promised to wait two years. So there was yeah. something there, but not that much. But the interesting part about solar panels is different. There are two stages. First, you build the solar panel, and then you install it. Yeah. Installation is much more costly yeah. than solar panel. And the solar panels union that has the installation guys is opposed to the solar panel tariff because they're losing jobs because it'll be higher priced. How did your experience in India? help you evaluate what can only be dubbed the license permit raj of us <laughs> steel and us sugar i have said to several people including some people in the government uh that all of that i learned in india i can now apply <laughs> so just a sense of like i mean first were you surprised by how us steel is as convoluted and as much of a government imposed permit system as it was in the developing world in the 1960s and 1970s and second how did america get here how does it get out of it <laughs> what is to be done uh well, obviously many people are perplexed not just me and it really is a mess it really is terrible and i guess i hope and think that at least some countries outside the us will be sensible enough not to do it and once that happens they will thrive and we will not not that i don't want us to thrive but i think we will not and that seeing what's going on when it isn't that bad may help uh so i'm i'm hopeful that we can get a solution before that i'm hopeful that some of us can think up something that will restore the wto more effectively and sooner and all the rest of it but i think ultimately it will happen because things will get so bad i did visit australia several times about the early 1970s and at the end of world war 2 australia new zealand the us canada were the four rich countries in the world yeah canada and new zealand has slipped and slipped and slipped the europe had come up and up and up and finally by the early 1970s it was clearly obvious and australians went to europe for their vacation or their whatever they saw shining new airports they came back home and they saw dirty dusty airports they saw the european cars looking at all this and they they saw the big rusty old things that have been built in australian assembly plants etc and it was a labor government that came in in 1973 and took everything out because they'd seen how bad it got and again yeah. it was a national consensus and i think it's now it's still true australia hasn't even had a recession since 1990 yeah. and i think that's partly because of the reforms earlier on that they got rid of a lot of that stuff that was so very counterproductive and maybe it'll have to happen again that some other part of the world gets to do the things that we ought to we were doing ought to do again I hope we can do it faster than that but I don't know. Are you hopeful for Oh, I'm hopeful of course. Okay. Now I want to get to the IMF part of your career okay. which which is the early 2000s. This is right after the 9/11 and uh, you know again the somehow you end up in these positions when there are several countries in crises, <laughs> right? Uh so uh you saw firsthand uh you know what happened to countries which have sort of untenable debt levels. What do you make of the US debt levels today? Well, there's a difference between international debt and domestic debt. Yes. And on domestic debt, you can always print money. Now, if you print enough money in their fiscal deficit long enough, you will get unacceptable inflation, yeah. like several thousand percent. So it's yeah. not a long-term cure-all, but it will do for quite a while. And at the moment, there is no substitute for the US dollar or no satisfactory substitute for the US dollar. Japan has a debt now, I think it's still about 270% of GDP. Yeah. they have interest rates lower than ours and so that's partly a factor but even so Japan has been carrying that debt for a long time but it's almost all domestic yeah and so but they recently had a hit finally i think the japanese uh, the yen has breached 165 uh, and and that caused quite a lot of uh, you know uh, chaos in the international markets also in japan yes of course but the, 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 that's i think quite independent of the debt level itself i don't think that's at the immediate Yeah, explanation of it. Uh in the United States of course we're we're still about 100%. Yeah. And that's a lot. And a lot of people are nervous. so a lot of people are distressed that it's not an issue so far in this camp presidential campaign and maybe it should be. Uh clearly fiscal policy uh looked 
to most of us to be too easy over the past couple of years when we didn't need it and all that. But that doesn't say that that fixes it. And at the moment, it looks as if much as there is debt and much as one of these days it'll go. And when it goes, it might go fast if nothing else happens first. Uh, that's the way it is. And as I said, at the moment, if you were a, a citizen of, I don't know, Sri Lanka, and you didn't have much faith in your own country's currency and look where to put it, you'd put it in dollars. When you were at the IMF, one of the first crises that you had to deal with was what was going on in Argentina. Of course, Argentina does this, you know, every few years. Well, Argentina was already in crisis by the time I got there. Correction. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, it was already in crisis. So one, what did you make of what was going on in Argentina at that time? And second, what do you make of what's happening under President Millet right now and the kinds of reforms he's trying uh, to push through, some of which are even more sort of uh, stringent than what was suggested by the IMF all those decades ago. And and how do you see everything play out in Argentina? Well, um, I mean, going back to 2001, uh, quite clearly, the problem was simply that um, spending was higher and so on and so forth. And they had tried to get the uh, exchange rate pegged and they couldn't. So finally, they had to do something because it was a crisis. They could no longer borrow in international markets. Argentine citizens had been, of course, getting whatever they could by their way, their own money out of the country as quickly as they could. And so it was a classic. Uh, there are no imports. We're in a crisis yeah. situation. No doubt about that. Uh, they were not, I don't know, there's no shorthand to give you a really easy account. But the basic problem is that they we're not willing, the politicians were not willing to fix it. Uh, the result of which was, of course, that they had to go through a debt restructuring and all that. Uh, they were a little bit lucky in commodity prices, which gave them a few good years after that. And then things started the same thing happening over again. And this time, as you know, the inflation got up, I guess, yeah. it was 250% by the <laughs> end of December or something like that, and all the rest of it. Now, what do I make of Millet? I'm going fast because uh, what he's promised... Uh, most of the good economists, Argentine economists I know, or most of those who observe Argentina carefully that I know, think that if Millet gets to do most of what he wants to do, that yes, he could succeed. But they also think the body politic will never accept it. Yeah. Uh, so the result of which is, uh, and at first, by the way, everybody said he hadn't a chance. Now they say, yes, he has a chance. So, so far, he's at least come with somewhere within uh, the ballpark where it isn't hopeless, and but on the other hand, it isn't done either. Uh, some of the things he promised could not be done. Yeah. You cannot dollarize without dollars. Uh, so that makes it straightforward. And so I don't think anybody knew he think that he'd do that. He would have to accumulate dollars first because otherwise, how are you going to get them? Now, money starts reflowing back that's out of the country. It could someday be done. Not that makes it a good idea, but it could be done right now. No. Uh, so there's that. But on the other hand, apparently he's cut the number of civil servants quite substantially, yes. quite quickly. Uh, the inflation numbers <laughs> were reported, I think, by the Wall Street Journal in great joy, saying the inflation rate was down, monthly rate was down from 12 to 8% monthly, not yearly, yeah. monthly. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, that's, that's still well over 100% a year. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, it is going in the right direction. I, I'm not sure. I was trying to I was trying to figure out if I were a citizen of a country that had 12% inflation in February and 8% in March, would I have been able as a consumer to tell the difference? I'm not sure. I, I think the consumers are able to tell the difference, actually. When Remember, I, this, is not, this is not per year. This is per month. Yes. And this is 12% in January and 8% in February. And it's different prices, different times. It's not everything going in lockstep. It's yes. cars last month and it's wheat this yes. month. I'm not so sure that they can tell. But anyway, whether they can or not, they certainly, enough of them, I do believe they were in a hopeless situation that they're willing to give him a little bit of breathing room. But he only has eight delegates out of, I think, 79 yeah. or some such number. And so he can't get much through the legislature. Some Argentine things, teens think that he may force it, be able to force it through. Others think he will wait until the elections, which are a year off. I'm not sure he has a year. I I feel like he's managed to get some early wins to yeah. show that, you know, he needs mm -hmm. business. And there hasn't been huge public revolt. I mean, yes, the unions are making some noise. The government servants are making some noise. And there are there are certain constituencies which are which were always going to be up in arms about some of this. But we don't have what many mm -hmm. people expected in terms of like big riots, the middle class being up in arms, people draining all their resources out of Argentina. I think some of that had already happened before that. So... It seems like things are better. And also, he seems very fiscally prudent, which I think is something the just the median 
Argentine understands very, very well. Because earlier it was, oh, fiscal prudence for the poor and and the government can be as uh, profligate as it wants. Mm. So he seems to have made some very serious cuts to government. In fact, the first president in a long time to get the deficit numbers under some kind of control. Though, of course, mm-hmm. everything in Argentina mm-hmm. is a different scale, right. a different level that we're talking about. So I'm somehow quite hopeful. I'm, I am I love the country. I'm very hopeful. Well, for I, I, I'm hopeful, too, because I, I'm not at all certain that if he fails, that there'll be another chance. I mean, yeah. Uh, and, and it does seem to me that Argentina could become another one of those countries that just to backwater for a long, long time. And I don't want to see that for the Argentines or for the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we started the conversation with the 50th anniversary of your famous AR paper, and I want to end with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Did you expect it to be such a big hit? It's, uh, you know, one of the 10 most influential papers, like so many things like that. No, I did not. How do you look back on that paper now, now that it's been 50 years since you wrote it? Well, I mean, obviously, I I, I still believe in it. There's no doubt about that. I'm not ready to reject it or anything. I mean, how do I feel about it? I'm glad it was has made a difference, and that's a good thing. What do you think made it such a big success? Like, what is it about that paper, that idea, those countries, those case studies that just somehow really hit the mark? Well, I mean, the first thing, even for economists, if you say something's just a transfer, you're less worried about it than, of course, if it costs in, in real resources, which is one of the things I was saying. But I think the second thing, too, is people have become more aware, as some of the uh, developing countries have had their corruption problems and so on and so forth, it's become more of an issue that's making headlines. And so there's more awareness that these things are going on in the world. If there's one piece of advice you would give Indian policymakers today, <laughs> what would it be? Oof. Just one. Quit. <laughs> <laughs> and to the new ones who come in. Uh, yeah, it's hard because what was one of them? You can't say don't have any regulation because that means don't even have traffic lights and you don't want that. And on the other hand, as you said, there's too much other stuff going on. I guess cleaning up the legal system and getting things going faster may be yes. where I would guess. But I, I, if I really had to be a responsible person, I wouldn't say anything until I did a little more homework. Yeah, no, contract enforcement is definitely no, the I'm not big one. I'm talking about in the courts. I'm yeah. talking about once I bring, because until you can, and, and I know the bankruptcy law was changed and all that, and I gather Still some things slow. are working better, but I don't know how much, and I don't know whether it's going to be fully effective or not. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. Uh, Anne Krieger, thank you so much for doing this. This was such a pleasure. Oh, pleasure to have you here. Thank you.